Right now, Roger Wolfson is on the line with us. He's the former counsel to Senators Lieberman, Kerry, Wellstone, and Kennedy, and a former TV writer. He wrote for Law & Order SVU, Saving Grace, The Closer, and Fairly Legal. He is the founder of a new group that's absolutely fascinating. They're doing some extraordinary work with candidates for public office, Democratic progressive candidates for public office. It's called the Writers Action Group. And in fact, the website is writersaction.com. His, uh, his uh, Twitter handle is Roger underscore Wolfson, W-O-L-F-S-O-N. Roger, welcome to the program. Hey, Tom. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. So if I'm thinking about running for political office, whether it's uh, local city council or school board or whether it's the state legislature or uh, whether it's Congress, U.S. Congress or, or even the U.S. Senate, um, or, or even, you know, people who are running for re-election who, you know, maybe just kind of squeaked by last time. What are the, what are the core skills? What, are the, what, is the, what is the key to messaging that a group of writers, a group of television writers and other kinds of writers, uh, you know, fiction writers, can share that can actually change, the, 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 the qualitatively change the ability of a candidate to win an election? Well, thank you for that question. And coming from you, it's kind of an honor to answer because I think you're somebody that understands this pretty much as well as it can be understood. Uh, what me, or what I and the other writers that I work with bring to the table is on a daily basis, our job is to bring out authenticity in actors, to write for them so that they're authentic, to coach them on the day um, through a director, obviously, and a lot of members of my group are directors, on how to speak with passion, with sincerity, with, um, with truth. And there's things that we've learned from the industry. There's things that we've learned about how to tell people how to connect to themselves. Because you know, and I'm, my guess is a lot of you, the people who are listening to your show right now know, that unless you yourself, Tom, have an emotional reaction to what you're talking about. And the people who are listening can't really connect to you. You are the cathartic experience for them so that they can understand your material, they can understand your message, they can accept and embrace all your facts, and they can learn to at least share your point of view. Without that, without the emotional connection, without the, the heart being involved, then everybody just starts to sound like a talking head. They just sound like, the, you know, like their mouths are moving and nothing's coming out. Yeah. So let's make this real for our listeners and viewers right now. Let's let's make it absolutely real. Uh, I'm a candidate. I'm thinking of running for public office. Walk me through the process. Ask me the questions. Well, I guess well, that's terrific. Okay, Tom. What I would start with is I would ask you, why do you want to run? I want to run because I want to hold corporate crooks accountable. All right. That's nice. Next question is, why? Why do you want to hold corporate crooks accountable? Because I've seen the damage that they can do. All right, let's talk about that damage. What damage have you seen? When I was born, my father was in college on the GI Bill, it was 1951. And uh, he had to drop out of college because mom had me and went to work in a steel mill in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, an Alcoa plant and was working in, and the steel the hot steel came out through these asbestos rollers and he worked literally for a year and a half every day in a cloud of asbestos and mm -hmm. about 15 years ago he developed mesothelioma the asbestos industry knew that their product caused mesothelioma they knew this in the 1930s they covered it up for years and years and years he de developed mesothelioma which is a particularly brutal form of lung cancer and he died an insanely painful death. I was sitting next to him with my hand on his shoulder as he drew his last breath. I would never want to die that way. He died throwing up blood. He died in extreme pain. It was, it, and, and he was on as much morphine as you could get. I, I mean, this, and having seen what this industry did to my father, I want to take this industry down. All right, well, Tom, first of all, on a personal note, I wasn't aware of the story of your father, and my heart goes out to him. What was his name? Carl. Carl. Now, I'm going to hold him in my prayers tonight, and you, and your family, and those he touched, and those who are devoid of him now because of what happened. Thank you. The next question I would ask you, Tom, is you talked about your, your father, and you did so beautifully. 
and emotionally. But I want to hear more about you in this. Give me a moment when, and because you talked about his death, which is obviously powerful, but I want to go back to a memory from childhood, if you have one, of when he came home after a long day and was coughing or was covered with dust or was, or, or even, even more intentionally, had a positive attitude coming home and brought you home a gift, but you could see the grit underneath his fingernails. I'm feeding you suggestions here, and I wouldn't sure. orderly do that with you. Um, but I, want, I, 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 I know you're a storyteller and an excellent one. Take us back to a moment with your father as a child that you can recall that had an emotional impact on you. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I can do that right now, Howard. I, I nearly started crying just a minute ago. I, 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 this is the opening chapter, by the way. It's, it's called The Story of Carl in my book, Screwed, um, you know, uh, which is right. about how, the, how the, the, the right wing has basically taken down the middle class. Um, but if I was to start getting it into that granular level of detail, I will break down on the air. Um, so where is there, is there a middle ground here where I can tell these stories or tell other people's stories that don't cause me to start just falling apart? Well, this is, well, you asked the work that I would do with you. And what I would do is we would probably be alone. Maybe one of your staffers there. Um, I would probably gently and almost therapeutically, and I say this also to you because you're a therapist, I would probably try and guide you there and see if we could get two elements of that that don't make you actually break down. Right. If we could take material and get there. I'm not going to push you on it now, obviously, for, for you know, because we're on the air, and, and I respect that. But it, it really, what you've given us now, too, is a teaching moment that I'd like to share with your listeners, because this is something that comes into play in every aspect of the work I do, both as a, both as a coach for politicians and as a, as a writer. And I just want to correct a couple of things from what you said earlier. One is that I still am a TV writer. I actually am working on a project at Sony and others, and I don't want to give that up, but the majority of my time is spent these days in politics, and I'm even on the Hill right now as we speak. Anyway, um, what I would definitely do is I would, you know, I, I would encourage you and others, and maybe even the people listening, to remember that in order to connect to people, we have to break down those barriers that separate us from them. Your experience, Tom, with Carl, with your father, as painful and as disturbing as it is, is actually a universal experience. I lost my mother to cancer. I'm sure everybody who's, who's right now listening to the show or watching it has had a death of someone that they care about or is afraid of losing someone that they care about. But in order to persuade people in order to affect people in order to connect people we have to be able to access that pain and express it in a way so that people can understand us so people can hear us so people have that shared experience with us and you have to do that as a writer very often um, when i teach writing um, and when i write myself i'm forcing myself to stare in the face of the hardest things that i have to address you know, and, and in that sense, storytelling has evolved over the years. If you, if you read Shakespeare, um, one of the things that you'll note is that whenever anybody dies, or typically when a character dies, they do so off screen. When there's a big fight, they have it off, off stage, and then people come back clutching each other or clutching their hearts, and, 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 and we hear about it. Um, even Shakespeare was afraid of going there. Hmm. But in this, day, in this day and age, Tom, in order to be an effective storyteller, and every politician is a storyteller, in order to be a, 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 in order to be a storyteller, the first thing you have to be is brave. And, and in terms of that bravery, what you're standing up to is your own emotional vulnerability. Because when you do it, Tom, when I do it, when a politician does it, it gives all of us permission to understand and accept our own humanity. So and that's what's really happening. So I'm, you know, seriously pissed off at Rick Scott, for example, for refusing to expand Medicaid in Florida and uh, right. got to know a woman whose best friend uh, was a, a young woman named Charlene Dill. She had three little kids. In fact, one of them looks so much like my son in, in one of the pictures that it's, it's uh, I don't think anybody could tell the difference. And right. um, Charlene had a heart condition and she had to take a medication that was fairly expensive. And because Rick Scott, and she was working three 
jobs. She was selling vacuum cleaners door to door, she was cleaning houses, and she was doing daycare. All of those three jobs added up to the point where she still couldn't afford health insurance. And she couldn't get Medicaid because Rick Scott refused to expand it. She was cutting her pills in right. half. One day she, she was on her way to her third job. She'd been working like 14 hours that day and she just dropped over dead. And um, I've been saying for years and years on the air, Rick Scott has Charlene Dill's blood on her hands, and, and it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a horrible story. And it's a story that's, according to Harvard, uh, Harvard Medical School, reported something, it repeated, uh, at least before Obamacare, about 40,000 times a year in the United States, and now around 15 or 20,000 times a year. Um, are you saying that just telling, and, and we just have 30 seconds to the hard break here, I'm sorry. Are you saying that telling Charlene's story isn't strong enough, it would have to be my story? What, yes, I am saying that, because what you've just said is a great story. It's very well articulated, and it's powerful, but I don't really see your personal connection to it. I'm not saying don't tell Charlene's story. I'm telling, telling you or suggesting to you that you tell Charlene's story from the perspective of how that impacted you, and then connect that story to your own life, and connect that story to the, then the next step beyond that is to connect that story to the people that you're talking to, so they feel like they're participants as well. Right. So uh, you tell that story and then say, you know, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, a, a relative or an acquaintance who's having to split pills right now or struggling with finances or, or whatever. It's I, just, I want you to get as close as you possibly can to Tom Hartman on that one. There I you want go. you to talk about your own experience. That's how you nail it. Roger Wolfson. Hang on just a second.